Okay, hi. Uh, I'm recording another one of these. It's been a little bit of a second um, because I moved, if you can't tell, if you're watching on YouTube. Um, If you're watching, not watching, if you're listening on Spotify or something else, um, yeah, I'm sitting on the same bed but in in a different room. Um, And it doesn't look quite as nice yet but we're gonna get there. (laughs) Um, We've been here for almost, yeah, about a month, actually. Um, Everything is unpacked, but we still need to, like, figure out decor, because we kind of, like, wanted to start over. So it's, like, been really depressing. There's, like, just nothing on the walls. I need to fix it. I need to fix it. But that's not what we're here to discuss today. (laughs) Yeah, I, this is my third episode of my podcast. Um, If you are familiar with my game, um, Welcome to American in Peril. I'm Mackenzie Smith, and we talk about current topics and things that are on my brain. Um, or if you're on YouTube, I don't really brand this as a podcast on YouTube, but it is, and you should go listen to it on Spotify also. I, today, wanted to talk a little bit about, well, I feel like there's only one topic to talk about right now, which is what's going on uh, in Gaza, but I also want to avoid stepping in it, and also I feel like if I'm not super qualified to talk about a topic, I just should not be talking about it, which is something I'll get into. Um, So I'm talking about something related, um, but separate, and you're going to follow me there, and you're going to like it. Yeah, Um, But before I do that, yeah, sorry, I'm really scattered today. It's like 4 p.m. and I like just watched a Cinderella story, the movie with Hilary Duff. Laugh out loud. Like just a total like gum gum brain movie where like I shut my shit off mentally for like an hour and a half. Um, So I'm trying to rewind from that. Yeah, so I moved. Um, I am back in Portland from my parents' house, which is not in Portland, but it's, like, in the area. Um, Not to dox myself. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, I'm in Portland. I'm having a good time. I love being back here. I love being in a city. I love being able to go outside and take a walk. And it's not just nothing. Um, You can see people. And the people have dogs and there's things you can go do. There's, you know, there's coffee shops and boutiques. Not that I would really ever shop at a boutique, but, you know, it's an option that I have now, which is awesome. Uh, otherwise, I, also my job's been really stressful recently. Um, I work in marketing, so we've been doing a lot of, like, Black Friday bullshit. Uh, I mean, Black Friday work that I'm very proud of if you're listening to this and you're my employer. And it's just, it's been very stressful, so I haven't had a lot of time to think about the podcast, but I am back. Um, and you know what? My listenership is like 30 people right now, so like, I, who cares? Oh my god, you guys don't care. You guys are like, just glad to get something at any point in time, because I have not promised you anything, so. Yeah, but we're back. We're better than ever, baby. Yeah, what else have I done? Um, I saw Priscilla recently. That's um, something that I've been thinking a lot about, actually. Um, That was like a big time, like, Sophia is back moment for me. So I love Sofia Coppola. She's my favorite director. Um, Like, Marie Antoinette's my favorite film. And I felt like Priscilla was a little bit of a spiritual successor to Marie Antoinette. So I was very happy with that. Um, Similar themes of, you know, like girl gets pulled into something that she kind of like may or may not have that much agency in and you know is isolated from the world and has to deal with that um however she's able to you know whether it's like positive or negative is like up to the audience but um anyway I just I really connected with it um and that's not to say like the beguiled was bad because it's not um it's like a Uh, it's like a six out of ten movie it's fine um on the rocks was not great i'm sorry to everyone involved um so this was i felt like we were back on the wagon (laughs) a little bit yeah it's like i've i've not dated elvis presley right i'm not i've never been married to elvis presley or anyone in an elvis presley um 
lifestyle. <laughs> but you know, I've, I have been in a relationship with a musician who did think that he was the first person to like ever read a book. Um, and it was like very constraining and very stressful. And like, I didn't feel like I could trust what was going on in my life. So I just, I feel like sh Sophia um, and Kaylee Spaney, I think that's how you say her last name, um, really portrayed that in a, I, thought, I think like a nuanced way that um, I think a lot of women will connect with. And I think that's a good thing. I liked it. Um, also the vibes were great. It feels very like spacious, um, but in like a, like spacious, but in a way that makes you feel a little scared. It's great. It's a great movie. I really would recommend going and seeing it. Um, what would I rate it? I'd give it an eight out of 10. It was great. It was a really good movie. Yeah, I feel like I was talking to uh, my friend Michaela about this the other day because we watched The Bling Ring because I've been, been in a Sophia mood and uh, Michaela has not seen very many of Sophia's films. So been walking them through the movies. <laughs> um, and I just, yeah, one of my favorite things about Sophia is that all of her characters are sort of isolated in a way, which like is really not an original thought when it comes to Sophia Coppola. Like there's essays and papers on this topic, but um, I feel very emotionally connected to her movies because of that. Um, just like having, like I grew up in a rural area, like there wasn't a lot to do, um, you know, only child syndrome. It's just, uh, it, it hits for me. I, I do understand like that feeling of being a young person, you know, just kind of stuck in a situation where no one's really uh, someone that you can relate to, you know, um, and what it's like to search for that continually and not really finding it. Yeah, it's, I just, I really like her stuff. Maybe it's more like she makes films about women that are sort of living lives at odds with like, how they see themselves or like how they really are um which i think is something that like many many women can relate to and i think sort of makes these arguments like well if you were in this situation would you react all that differently i do think like if most young women were thrust into a marie antoinette situation maybe you know bitches would be shopping i like i don't know what else you would do there's nothing else to do there's no real responsibility if you were Priscilla, what else would you do besides like sit and wait and be sad? Like these are, um, it's like exploring like these social roles that we all have. And I just, they make me, they're such sad movies. They make me really sad. Um, but they're so like beautiful and real. And I don't know, maybe I should do a Sofia Coppola centric episode at some point where I just talk about these things in a much more articulate way than I'm doing right now. Anyway, yeah, um, Priscilla, I liked it. Um, but what I did want to talk about today, <laughs> besides the shit I've been watching recently, um, is that I just think, and I'm looking at a laptop because I have notes. I've, I've wrote a fucking script for this. I, do, I think there's been a bit of a quote-unquote vibe shift. <laughs> um, and it is not like in social media's favor um, I think where people used to use socials to like connect with friends and family, um, you know, people that you know, genuinely, I think social media now is so much more about, um, you know, incentivizing going viral and like following influencers and potentially making money, even if you are like a regular person, um, that people are starting to get fatigued of what it's become in the past couple of years. I think really specifically since 2020, although... It's really been going down the drain um, for lo much longer than that. Longer than I've probably even been online. Anyway, yeah, quick history of at least like my experience with social media, which is, um, I think, a good enough timeline for us to understand uh, what social media has looked like through the years. At least by my estimations, MySpace... Why did I trip over that word? MySpace and Facebook were the first really big social media sites that I think if you were to ask someone of like baby boomer age um, or even like Gen Xers, like what is social, they would probably say Facebook or MySpace. Um, though you did also have things before that, like Friendster, LiveJournal. Friendster was sort of more comparable to MySpace with like sharing photos, sharing blog posts, intending to like grow a following. 
Um, like MySpace and Friendster were people you knew, but you also could interact with people outside of that. Um, and live journal is kind of more comparable to, for people my age, like Tumblr, um, where it is much more about blogging, microblogging, um, with a level of anonymity if you wanted it to be. Um, and all of those sites sort of contributed to shape like what social media looks like now, right? Um, specifically that social media could be used to like boost your own profile um, or to treat it like a semi-public diary in addition to talking to people that you know or trying to make friends online. Um, and I think in this respect, Facebook is still kind of unique in a way. It was uh, started as a way to rank women. Uh, face mash is what it was called. Uh, if you've seen the social network, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then sort of turned into more of a college specific site where you could hang out with people online, talk to people online, post, became what Facebook is now. And then moved from con students connecting with students to everybody connecting with everybody. Um, it has stuck with that, like people, you know, ethos, um, throughout its entire lifespan. And you can like follow, it's considered pages on Facebook, you know, like, um, what's an example? John Green has a Facebook page and you can like his page and then you get his Facebook posts, but that's not his personal account, right? His personal account, if he has one, <laughs> um, would be only people that he knows and that he can add back and it's a mutual, you're friending each other, you know? Um, and those pages are like sometimes run by famous people like John Green or their team maybe like Britney Spears had her team run hers for a long time dark chapter of her life but you know um there aren't really Facebook influencers though you know like you could follow a Facebook page to get info on someone or on a uh, business whatever um but there's no, there are, I mean, I'm sure there's Facebook influencers that I'm just not aware of, but it's not like a huge thing, especially with people of my age and they have other platforms that they're working with. It's not just Facebook. But the idea like of Facebook is to keep up with your personal circles generally um, without having to text people or call them or see them in person or generally like interact with them at all. Um, like there's people that I went to high school with that I know exactly what they're doing because if I feel like it, I could go onto Facebook and I can click onto their page and I can see that they got married last year or had a kid or whatever. That's crazy, but they do that. <laughs> yeah, it just, it, it's, I think it's still the best site to like, if, if the person is active on it, at least to scratch the itch of like, I wonder what this person is up to that I haven't talked to in five years, you know. And that is becoming, I think, more and more rare, um, especially with people my age, because like I'm 25. If I were to go on Facebook, a bunch of people that I know from high school are still on it, but the majority of them stayed in our hometown. Um, it feels very much more like a suburban site, if that makes sense. Whereas I think people that are very um, active with like a career or take a lot of photos, maybe, um, are posting on Instagram, LinkedIn, other sites. Um, I don't know why that is. That's uh, outside of my scope of sociology. But that's that's what I have perceived trend-wise. And the number does dwindle, I think, over the years. Like, how many people are actually uploading to Facebook? Like, I think I maybe uploaded to it semi-frequently until I was maybe, like, 18. Haven't used it since, so... <laughs> Anyway, but I do go on it and I do catch up with people without talking to them sometimes. Um, but yeah, going back a little bit, I do want to touch on MySpace because um, MySpace was also kind of technically for people that you knew. Um, you know, I had people that I was friends with that had MySpace. They generally only followed people that they knew from school. But, you know, you could follow celebrities, bands, um, you know, Taylor Swift had a MySpace. Uh, there are a bunch of very popular influencers on MySpace that are like not no longer influencers. You know, a bunch of scene girls. That was a thing. You know, a bunch of bands blew up on MySpace as well. Just getting your music out there through the site. Um, Arctic Monkeys, Panic at the Disco, Lily Allen, Owl City. Um, you know, bands that kind of blew up in that like 2005 to 2007 sort of, you know, big MySpace years. Um, and that is something about MySpace that I, like, as someone who didn't ever have one, sort of have mythologized, I guess, because it's very hard nowadays to get people to see your music. 
um, you know, maybe on YouTube, but it's really hard on Twitter. It's really difficult on Instagram. You can do it on TikTok, but like it may just become a meme. It may not, you know, have any staying power. Whereas I think MySpace sort of had this like, oh no, we're sharing something. This is like very much about the music. It's, mo- it's more about um, discovering things. I just, I think that's cool. I, I wish we still had something like that. Maybe SoundCloud was like that for a while, but not really even anymore. It's too like saturated. So anyway, yeah, I kind of envied kids that were a little older than me that had a MySpace, um, especially because I really wanted to decorate my page. <laughs> like I liked that there were little widgets where you could have like a pet and like, you know, share the music you're listening to and code music into like autoplay on your MySpace, which I would do on Tumblr later, but blah. yeah, I just thought MySpace was cool. And ranking your friends is like a little silly. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. There's just something very um, nostalgic to me about MySpace. And I think there's for most people that um, you know were cognizant of it in that era or used it. But yeah, I think that was kind of the first social media by like my estimations that really blew up and was very much about like showing people who you are and like what your interests were. Um, it was more about individualizing which is, I think, more what social media is about now, like showcasing an aesthetic, for instance, you know. But as social media grew, um, MySpace died. (laughs) Like by the time I had social media, nobody really used it. Um, Tumblr and Twitter took its place pretty quickly. Uh, Instagram debuted shortly after those ones, um, you know, in the 2010s. So speaking from my own experience, um, social media was very exciting. Um, I really became aware of it when the girl who lived next door to my grandparents showed me her MySpace. Um, I really wanted one. My parents wouldn't let me have one. I was like nine. This would have been like 2007, probably. Um, I had a YouTube account. That's a whole thing. You can go on my YouTube that I have now, which is not the same one I had then. And I have a video where I go back and watch some of those videos. I made Club Penguin music videos and skits. Um, really embarrassing, but really funny. Yeah, I just, people had a lot of optimism, I think, around social media at that time. And I think as a kid, especially, it was very intoxicating. Um, You know, you want people to see you and you want to see other people and you want to like take part in the creativity that you perceive as like being online. Because at this point in time, like you got to remember, it's mostly people between the ages of like, 13 to 25 that are posting a like vast majority of this content um you have people older than that that are you know started with the internet like much much earlier you know 80s 90s um and have been taking part in like message boards chat sites whatever um but social media as we know it was like very much pioneered like by millennials um by my generation um gen z i'm a gen zer um, but I think that's waning. Um, and that, I don't know. I think in hindsight, that's pretty sad. Um, you know, I remember this is like a weird thing that I, I remembered as I was writing the script, but, um, I remember not to keep bringing up the green brothers, but they used to have t-shirts, I think that said team internet. And I cannot for the life of me, find an image of this i found one where tyler oakley was wearing a team internet t-shirt so like it did exist and i think i remember like grace helbig mamory hart hannah hart like kind of all taking part in this like team internet thing it was just like a a phrase people threw around and like the basic concept was like people who are making things online are the future of like mass media um and that the people who were making things online were servicing a kind of creativity that was not available to um, you know, studios to television networks, and that that was like something unique that was going to somehow positively impact um, the lives of many, which I don't know if it's done that or not. Um, but that was like very much the like overarching attitude online at the time, um, at least in some circles. You know, I never took part in like 4chan or anything. So obviously attitudes on sites like that are going to be different. Um, But on, you know, YouTube, Tumblr, Twitter, um, I do think people generally thought for a while that social media was going to be like a great equalizer of sorts where people who may not have had access to traditional 
you know, ways of making art, we're going to be able to make that art and still make money off of it and have people see it. But back to Facebook, um, that was something that I wanted really badly (laughs) uh, when I was younger. Um, I think when I was about 10, I got my first one under a fake name. My parents said I could have one with a fake name just to play the games, Farmville, whatever. Um, I did try to find the account, it's deleted. (laughs) I played the little games, the little quizzes, and maybe it was just stealing my data, but I was having fun with it, and that's all that matters. Uh, And then I was 11, I got a real Facebook with my name on it, um, which I used to post Kesha lyrics, primarily. Um, And send flare to people, they were like little buttons, um, and you could have a flare board that had all these buttons on it that people sent to you. And a bunch of kids at my middle school and I would send flair back and forth. Anyway, um, I had an unhealthy relationship with the internet by the time, you know, I'd had Facebook for like six months or so. Um, so I deleted it. I was using it constantly. My parents were not happy with me. I deleted that. I deleted my Club Penguin. I deleted my Roblox. And I was no longer talking to strangers on the internet. And then <laughs> I came back to Facebook when I was 13. And that's still the same account that I have today. Um, and I've sort of barely used it since I got that account. Like I used to, I, like I said, I used to post like semi-frequently up until I was maybe 18. So like a five year span of time, but I was never very into using it. Um, my friends and I do use messenger. Most people I know use messenger to communicate still. Um, I have learned that might be a generational thing, like a late, uh, or I guess it would be an early Gen Z thing. Um, cause my boyfriend's friends also use it to communicate, And we're all around the same age, but people younger than me don't do that. They use like Snapchat, Instagram, um, and people older than that use regular SMS. So obviously that's generalizing, but uh, I do think that's kind of interesting because I use Messenger like literally every day, like all day. Um, But yeah, uh, as for other social media sites, Tumblr very much took over my life for many years. Um, I feel like you can hear that even in my speech patterns, which is a little bit embarrassing, um, but it's that's how it is, and I'm owning it. Uh, I like definitely understand when millennials are like, you know, I spent hours and hours on my MySpace, like making it look good and like coding it to like look a certain way and putting music on it, because like that's literally what I did on Tumblr. I was on it, um, maybe up to six hours a day on weekends for the first couple of years that I had it, like literally like coding my page to look a certain way, um, you know, my theme, quote unquote, uh, you know, just for blogging garbage, talking to other insane and depressed like teenage girls. Um, and that is like a very formative experience, you know, uh, it, it, it did rock. I'm not going to lie. Like, I think people really talk down Tumblr, but like if you were on it, you know, like it was a lot of fun. Um, it can still be a lot of fun. I, I do still use it from time to time. Yeah, maybe I can do a Tumblr-centric episode too because there's, there's so much ground to cover. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll, I'll bring some Tumblr girls on. We can talk about it together. But yeah, I don't know. What I mostly liked about Tumblr though was that it was mostly like a name bullshit, whereas other social media sites kind of tried to pretend like they were serious. Like it is still like to this day like completely unmarketable as a site and like loses money every year. Um, you know, the jokes are too vulgar and weird and gross. And like the visual content is mostly stolen. Like there's screenshots of movies or, you know, it's fan art or it's art that can't really make it somewhere else, but is like still interesting. Um, the politics are prevalent enough for the entire site that, you know, people don't want to market on it because it's like too far left or whatever. And it rocks. Like I was never on that site and still am not advertised to in a way that matters because you can't you can't there's you cannot (laughs) you can't influence on it there's like literally no way to make it as as a tumblr influencer unless you like maybe get picked up to become a model i know that's a thing you know there's a orion carlotto i think is her name i'm definitely butchering how you say her name but like there there were tumblr girls that became models um that were posting you know pictures of their outfits and whatever um But otherwise, like, you're not on there to do that. You're on there for the vibes. And that's how social media should be. (laughs) I don't know. Sometimes I think Instagram could have been something like that. But, like, especially since it's been bought by Facebook, it does feel sort of like a big advertisement. 
Um, you know, I'm sure it depends on what you follow, but I do follow some influencers. You know, I like a little outfit and spo. I like to see like books. I like to see, mo- I like to see what people are, you know, wearing and doing. And I, you know, that's my own fault, <laughs> my own damage. But, you know, it is frustrating to go on there sometimes and be flooded with images of like wealth and money. Those are the same things, <laughs> but like <laughs> to see people that have so many things And then, you know, you scroll one post below and it's like someone you went to high school with and they're like struggling to get by. Um, You know, it just it's one of those places where you can really see the wealth gap. And it's very gross sometimes. It's sort of there was an era of Instagram where like I think it was easy to find like good photographers that weren't going to push anything you know, like 2013 to 2015, I guess, um, you know, and people you knew just posted like filtered like mirror photos or whatever. Um, but lately it does. It definitely feels like people are on there to brag and that's what it's for. Um, and that is shitty. It doesn't feel great. Sometimes I get on there and I, I get off, you know, 30 minutes later and I'm like, well, I didn't buy a house and I didn't go on vacation. So (laughs) guess I'll die. (laughs) You know, like it feels like shit. So I don't know. I kind of, I would love to see stats between like Instagram users and people who have a lot of credit card debt. I think that would be really fascinating. <laughs> anyway, as uh, in terms of like new social, new as in like second wave social media sites um, that people are still using right now, that leaves me with uh, Twitter and Reddit, which I did still want to cover. Um, the only remaining social media is that I think have any like real social currency besides instagram like no one uses blue sky no one uses mastodon the like twitter replacements like not not unless you're like really nerdy about twitter in the first place which is like get a life go outside you know i guess there's linkedin like but that's like for finding jobs and i know people say like teens are on linkedin now but like oh my god no they're not they're genuinely not like that's like five kids that you interviewed for the new york times and it's uh, yeah it's it's reddit and twitter that's really where people are online that's where the majority of discourse gets started and both are mostly for losers like especially reddit uh (laughs) even though everybody uses reddit like everybody uses reddit it's easy to find news. You can filter by like your interests. Everything has a subreddit, but it's also really easy to find like horrible posts that make you mad. And I think that's where they get the majority of their users. <laughs> and that is questionable. Um, it is one thing that's nice about Reddit. I do feel like you can have real conversations on it that are encumbered by word count like you would be on Twitter. But even then, like you can be encumbered by mods. And then that's its whole other, that's a whole other can of worms. And I feel like Twitter, which X, it's now X. I'm not calling it that. I refuse. Um, I do feel like it used to be cool. I'm not sure what it is now. (laughs) I'll be honest. Like it is still, you know, mostly like media people, journalists, whatever, what have you. And teenagers that are talking about like BTS and Harry Styles, which is exactly what it was when I was on it as a teenager. Since it became X and was bought by Elon Musk, I do feel like the vibes have changed significantly. I feel like the algorithm's worse. I see a lot less stuff that actually interests me. And it's a little bit, it's depressing. Um, Yeah, but that's kind of the topic of today's pod video, whatever this is. Why is everything getting worse? Let me, let me ask the question. I, I do have some thoughts on this. Which is like, first of all, everything is owned by like a handful of companies, right? They're all like familiar names. So Meta on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, which I didn't cover because it doesn't matter. And WhatsApp, that's four huge apps, right? And that's all Facebook, basically. Um, Google owns YouTube, big, big mega corporation. We all know Google. Uh, Microsoft owns LinkedIn. So there's that one. Uh, Elon Musk owns Twitter. Reddit is owned by the same company that owns Condé Nast. So news, it's all news all the way down. And the major sites are like not independently run anymore, which is, that is how they started, right? They were independently founded. So like Facebook has Mark Zuckerberg and MySpace had Tom, what's his face? And Tumblr had David Karp. Like these were guys (laughs) that got their start, you know, by making these sites and then growing them significantly to the point where they had to either sell them or become overlords and the internet was still like i don't know it still feels like even 15 years ago the internet was such a virtual wild west that it's it's hard to imagine that these people would have 
the power that they, they do now, or that these companies at least would have the power that they do now. One of the things that really frustrates me about going on the internet today is that when I was younger, you know, un- high school, high school and younger, you could go online and there were a lot of different sites to visit besides the f- apps that were on your phone, right? Like, There were message boards, there were fan sites, there were flash games, there's blogs, like, these are things that used to have their own domains. It's really weird to think about that, like, so many people that got their start, like, blogging, for instance, like, Tabby Gevinson had her own blog. She was not connected to social media at all. And, like, Flash is dead. Message boards are largely located, like, on Reddit. Although Lana Boards, shout out, is still around. (laughs) Um, Fan sites, like, got funneled to Tumblr and AO3. Uh, and blogs are like substacks now. Like everything is has been funneled, um, and it's very rare that you'll be like, "Oh, I read this site." Like, no, you don't. They have an account on Instagram, and you get recipes from them on Instagram. Or, you know, Tavi Gevinson now wouldn't have a fashion blog; she would just have an Instagram, and that I think is part of why things feel a little off. You know, everything feels kind of samey. Um, cause you know, everything gets consolidated and I think the more things become consolidated, the more they become commercialized because ads are like, I don't know, ads were always run on every site online. Like I'm not going to like pretend that that wasn't the case. Cause like, you don't know, y- you start to get popular online. You want to be able to afford the domain and like how many people are visiting the domain. So you have to run ads. That's whatever, like digital real estate, blah, blah, blah. But as companies get bigger and bigger and bigger and are bought by you know yahoo or google or whatever they become in like industrialized sites where ads are run like much more frequently and much more obtrusively because they need the eyes they need the money and you know everything has to be ad friendly on the site or you risk pissing off like the monetary source that keeps everybody employed and addicted to uploading content like especially on youtube you know um, youtube basically forces you to keep uploading or you lose out on algorithmic favorability Um, and therefore, you know, ad time and money. Um, Like if I swear on YouTube, for instance, this video could get demonetized and I therefore don't make any ad money. Not that I was making any in the first place because you have to be a YouTube partner to do that now. Um, (laughs) And I'm, I used to be and now I'm not. But yeah, if you're not ad friendly, um, you're not seeing that money in the first place, even if the content you're making is good and you have a lot of viewers. And then on apps like TikTok, which is its own thing i don't really want to get into tiktok today to be honest it really it depresses me um like the algorithm is a lot less likely to pick up your content if you swear or talk about serious topics so like a lot of code words have been created by like younger gen zers to get around like some of these rules like you know quote unquote like unaliving someone you know for killing someone or whatever um sewer slide like mascara or which are really serious topics that have been coded with like these cutesy names, which I do think is gross. I do think is bad. I do think is like desensitizing people to, you know, bigger issues at hand um, are ways to get around like being banned or like, you know, or worse, uh, ignored. And that (laughs) is all incentivized by algorithms and ad money and just money. Anyway, I feel like all that should be like fairly obvious if you're somebody who uses the internet frequently um you know especially if he used to use it back in the day um like it used to be a place where you know weird people with too much time on their hands went to like hang out and talk and you know you got to author the terms of your space um but as soon as capital got involved and people with money realized they can make more money off of you you little weirdo uh by advertising to you i think that's when it was basically over which has been in the process of being over (laughs) since like 2009 that's being really generous because everybody had to make room for the business interest. And if it didn't suit the business interest, like it got put down, like it's gone. Like Flash, you can't make money off of Flash games. It's really, really hard. So like Flash is gone. Too many sites means too much money like in other people's pockets. So it gets consolidated. You know, if there's too many fashion blogs, they're not going on Instagram to get fashion advice, you know? So you got to make sure all the fashion girlies are coming to Instagram. So... Anyway, this really sounds like I'm trying to like make a conspiracy, but this is just literally how money works. Isn't that crazy? People love a guaranteed investment. Like you figure out that people spend more time online when they're experiencing really extreme emotions like anger, sadness, you know, they find something funny, they're horny. There's a lot of time spent 
making you money just by investing in those emotions. Like, how can we make more of that happen? You know, the algorithm's going to push some shit that makes you really sad or makes you laugh. And sometimes those things are good. And sometimes those things are horrible and make you feel awful all the time. Like, I think a lot of people my age, especially get really trapped into like this anger cycle of this, you know, you go on TikTok and you see a bunch of shit that makes you mad because that's what the algorithm has like been trained to do because that's what you spend time looking at because you're reading all these comments where people are fighting and it's like, okay, so now you see shit every day that makes you mad and your blood pressure is getting raised and it makes you feel horrible. And like all of that time is just spent like putting money in TikTok's pocket. Oof, I don't like it. I'm not a fan. Like, I don't know. O- open up your like Instagram or your Twitter or your Reddit right now. Like, wh- what are you, what are you going to see? <laughs> I'm going to make a guess. <laughs> it's probably Gaza. And uh, that's the topic of today's video. No, that's really not. Um, I, but th- I, you see my point, right? Like it makes people upset to see images of war. So you're going to see it. That's, it's making people money. It's, it's awful. It's really awful. To get into that topic just because I do, I can't really ignore it. I'm gonna fix my ponytail. Actually, I think it's a pigtail. If you have two little ones, that's considered a pigtail. Isn't that crazy? Because they're smaller and pigs have smaller tails. Anyway, you're gonna see things that make you mad. And I feel like a huge part of what makes people mad is misinformation, which brings us to our next topic of today. Um, people love to get online and lie. I do it. I have done it since the day I joined the internet. <laughs> What doesn't rock, right, is when companies, media companies, and various governments uh, use the internet to do the exact same thing. That's crazy, right? People wouldn't do that. They do. Uh, Yeah, me getting online and telling my Twitter followers that my dog likes it when I put a little sweater on her and she loves me and gives me a big kiss, that's a lie. She hates me and she hates it when I put a sweater on her. That's fine, though. I'm making a white lie about my life. I think that's totally, that's like what the internet's for. That's fine. Like, that's a joke, basically. But like, that's not the same thing as like a spokesperson for Benjamin Netanyahu. How the fuck do you say his last name? I've been butchering it like for weeks now. Netanyahu, his spokesperson, (laughs) recently tweeting a video of like Palestinian militants firing rockets at Israel. Um... Maybe make sure that video is current. Maybe make sure you're not lying about that currently happening at the moment that it's not happening, you know, um, or there were claims being circulated on Twitter, for instance, that like there was a Palestinian man that was faking injuries in a video because another man filming himself walking through rubble sort of looked like him, um, only for that to be debunked. They're two different men because, you know, it's really hard to tell people apart sometimes, apparently. Um, you know, lies on that scale that like deny violence and like deny human suffering are very different from someone going online and lying about their life. Neither are really great. Um, but there's certainly a difference and there's different levels of harm, um, that can be done online. So much harm can be done online, but I don't want to, uh, particularly get into like election fraud stuff, mostly because it bores me and it's been done to death and you can... I'll just follow me where I'm going with this without me detailing it. But Facebook also for years has run on like this like engagement based quote unquote algorithm that like promotes content regardless of legitimacy, um, which then obviously continues to spread misinformation to a bunch of media illiterate boomers and Gen Xers. And honestly, you guys, meaning millennials and Gen Zers, think that you're really media literate, um, but it's actually extremely easy to get you guys to believe anything online. This includes me, like I'm not pointing fingers, but like someone will post like, I don't know, like I was today years old when I found out whales pee through their blowhole and you guys are gonna like the tweet and be like, wow, I didn't know whales pee through their fucking heads. And you're like, no, someone tweeted that online and you just believed it because you read it online and they said it like they had authority, right? Obviously I just made that up. Also, whales don't do that. But I get shit like that on my feeds all the time where like someone will make up a fact and then everybody's going to share it, especially like celebrity gossip or like something that doesn't matter that much. But then when it does matter, I don't know, guys, I think you should start doing research on things before you start posting about it. And maybe you can act like that, but like doesn't mean that you should. I've been really mad about what's happening in Gaza. I'm like, 
I think everybody should be. It is insane that we've made like so many excuses as like a country, the US, for like what's happening over there and our part in it um, for decades, not just right now, but like for decades. And at the same time, like, I don't know if it's helping anybody involved, especially and including like the people of Gaza for like a bunch of Americans to be fighting each other online about it. That's basically what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, like protests are good, calls for a ceasefire are good, but like, what is you posting on Instagram gonna do about it? It's, it's narcissism to believe that it's like doing anything positive for people. Um, like it's, it's narcissism in the same way, like posting black boxes for like blackout Tuesday in 2020 was narcissism, you know, like it's genuinely not about the movement at that point. It's about you promoting your place as a, you know, an intellectual and like empathetic person, um, in, in the American milieu. Um, it's like, you know, it's quote unquote, like raising awareness without you having to do anything of worth, and then you can just pat yourself on the back. And that does piss me off. You can just go on with your life, most people, in these situations. Like, if you don't know anybody in the Middle East, if you don't know anybody who's affected by, like, police brutality, you can just go on with your day. And that, like, you're not, you're still not doing anything of substance by posting. You have the opportunity to go do something of worth, whatever that may, may mean to you. Um, but posting is not. It's not it. That's not what it is. This is also not to say like you shouldn't talk about things that matter or that you see injustice in. I just, I think we need to be a little bit more intentional about things and stop pressuring all of your peers, which I do see a lot with people, especially people I went to college with, especially people that are educated, like into making statements when you're likely not qualified to make a statement. Like I don't even really want to talk about you know, Israel and Gaza in this podcast, because I'm frankly not qualified. The only thing I'm qualified to talk about is like my experience seeing my peers posting about it. And, you know, I think the best ways to go about that are following people who live there, following people that like are literally like in it, you know, um, and posting videos when they can, even though, you know, internet's been shut off on and off. Um, I just... There's other ways to get your information um, than, you know, infographics on Instagram <laughs> and sharing stuff that is not a primary source. So and I just th I think we there's not a lot of value placed on letting people get educated um, and giving people time to speak about something, how they want to approach something, if they feel like they should be talking about it at all. Um, you know, people have had job threats over posting about, you know, the war going on. So anyway, um... Yeah, social media. I just, I think it's on its way out, <laughs> genuinely. Um, I just, I know so few people anymore that speak about it with the kind of optimism that I used to see um, in like, you know, 2011-ish, you know, the Green Brothers, as I was saying. Um, I don't know if I think people that are optimistic about the internet now, it's like maybe Grimes. I don't think we all want to be like hanging out and the metaverse with Grimes, you know? Um, like, she's just not a good point of reference for public opinion. <laughs> so, what? Um, I don't know. The time I spend online is, like, very frequently now just, like, marred by, like, guilt and fear and anger for, like, all the things I'm not doing and things that make me upset and all the things I'm seeing online that I consider to be, like, you know, just shitty and or, you know, unjustifiable or whatever. Um, you know, I, I go on subreddits that just make me angry because they make me angry and I'm like addicted to being angry or like I go on Twitter, I go on Tumblr and I get a few good laughs and a few okay laughs and I, you know, maybe see something that makes me sad or jealous and then I feel like shit for the rest of the day because I wasted it on my phone. You know, it's just, we have so much else we could be doing. Isn't that crazy? Like, you ever think about that? Like, I could be reading a book right now instead of a, like a post. That's crazy. Like I went to the bookstore <laughs> the other weekend and I wanted to like maybe find a book on like, you know, Israel, Palestine. And I, the entire section of the store was like cleared out because other people had the same thought. They were like, you know, I'm going to go like ransack that shit. Like, you know, it's Russia and it's 1915 and the books are the bread. They were doing what they needed to do. And the only thing left were like two copies of like Netanyahu's biography. <laughs> So, you know, it's people that like want to get like genuinely educated about this topic and like want to understand like what's going on. 
And that is great. You can read about it. You can get a real book by a person whose like, whole career has probably been to understand the conflict in Israel-Palestine. That's crazy. You can even watch a movie or a documentary or go for a walk. <laughs> you could totally do something else. You could go to a bar. You could take your dog to a dog park or like see your friends or knit or bake or paint or sing or learn an instrument or like make a funny little robot or whatever people who went to school for STEM stuff do. I just, there's so much other things you can do with your spare time besides go on your phone. Like anything that gives you energy instead of taking it away. And I feel like that's all that my phone does now. I'm holding it in my hands. And this is fine because I'm not necessarily on my phone. But I, you know, when I'm using it like this, you can't see if you're listening to it, but I'm holding it like I'm just on my phone. It's taking my energy away nowadays. And I don't like it. I need to find a way to make these episodes less scattered. But anyway, that is the episode. Um, I really encourage you to do something uh, that isn't being on your phone today, whatever that is. Um, clean your house. Do one of the other things I mentioned, a hobby. Um, certainly read a book. I feel like reading a book is like a really good antidote to whatever goes on in your phone. Um, yeah, just like Pinky promised me. You'll, you'll do something else today. Thank you. Go get a book. Invite out a friend. The, actually, that's a really good one. Invite out a friend you haven't seen in like at least a month and just catch up. That's going to make you feel really great. You have tasks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, I've been ending these podcasts with things that I, I en- I've been enjoying recently. Um, and I did open with Priscilla, so I'm going to skip past that. Uh, I did see Killers of the Flower Moon, and I did enjoy it. I think I rated it too highly on Letterboxd. I think it's more of like a 7 out of 10 for me. Um, I gave it a 10 out of 10, and that's because I felt really strongly about the ending. But I think the more I reflect on it, I, you know, it ha- it has strokes of genius. I really like that scene where Leo takes the the poison insulin that he's been giving Molly, and they just like stare at each other while there's the while uh, the fire is burning in that field. That was crazy. Obviously, I really like the ending. Um, but I think the more I've thought about it, the more I just kind of feels like a standard history flick a little bit. Um, and I kind of just wanted it to be a little bit, a little bit more, you know. Um, but it is a great movie. It's just, I think for me personally, didn't hit the way it hit some other people. That's fine. We'll see how I feel about it in a few months. Uh, yeah, I finally got into Black Country, New Road. Uh, the place where he inserted the blade. Crazy song. Um, been liking the new Hannah Diamond record. Listening to a lot of old Gwen Stefani, specifically the songs Crash and Bubble Pop Electric, which I think are good precursors to Charlie XCX, Queen of Cars. Um, Radiohead in Rainbow has been listening to. And Oasis, What's the Story, Morning Glory, been listening to. Those are like older ones for me, but revisiting. Um, for books, if you do want a little book recommendation, I finished reading Big Swiss. It's behind me on, the, on in my bed. I'm sitting in my bed. Um, if you're on YouTube, you actually get to see. <laughs> um, it just it has some really uh, interesting things to say about therapy and trauma in a way that like was deconstructing the sort of like, you know, therapy helps everything and you you know thinking about trauma is like super helpful and whatever um i think it sort of questions those narratives and is it leaves up a little bit more room for uh you know different ways that can go for people uh and it's pretty funny it had some it was funny i liked it it was a, a funny but like cathartic book um little like l- ladies disaster ladies <laughs> book uh yeah i would recommend if you're looking for something that's like a little bit humorous but also you know covers some serious ground and has a bunch of animals in it like dogs and bees and donkeys and things um yeah it was a good book i liked it anyway that's it um i love you and i'll see you next time as we continue to improve this podcast together goodbye